Well, it's a privilege to be here in the same room as the Utopia Strong and in the very room where your album was conceived and a lot of it was made. Steve, just uh, tell us a little bit about how the band came about. Um, well, the, the band came about reversed, really, because the three of us became very good friends uh, around sort of 2017, I would say, um, as a group of, of people. And um, we decided to hang out a bit more. And, and then because of sort of the interest of having similar interest in music, we decided to just sort of have a, an improvisational session. And, um, and it went from there, really. So the band came about after we'd made some music and we thought possibly we could make it into an LP. Um, but it was only when we actually started to make some music, we thought, actually, this is pretty, it's what we'd like, what we'd like to buy, what we'd like to listen to. And a lot of it was made in this room. Yeah, so 2018, January the 2nd, we sat down um, and it carved us his idea to, to have a, a jam, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that means. And then at the end of the night, we just went, this is, this, we like it. Uh, and then we, then we set about for the rest of the 2018, trying to make it into, into tracks. Uh, Carvis, you, you, you said that um, it, it felt like there was an element of magic at play in making, yeah, the, making the album. Yeah, absolutely, just because, you know, having been a musician most of my life and done a fair bit of improvising, it doesn't always turn out this well. You know, a lot of, a lot of it, you know, turns out pretty badly, actually. And it felt like all three of us were giving each other space and were listening to one another and so much of it sounded really deliberate. It felt like, you know, what, what improvising should be really, which is sort of composing in real time. And it, the, the strike rate, we, we recorded about nine pieces, about two and a half hours worth of music. And although, you know, some of them took a bit of a while to, to get going, there was, it was really, really good. And there was, there was sort of nothing that you listened back and thought, oh, I wish you hadn't done that. Oh, I wish that, which usually happens with these things. And it was like, God, this... This sort of feels like magic, <laughs> you know. And, we, and a lot of the time, we don't even remember really coming up with with, with it. it. You know, it was actually a real shock to us listening to the stuff back. It was as if someone else had come up with it. And then after that, we just sort of, you know, we just spent a great deal of time listening. And between the three of us, going, uh, yeah, maybe it doesn't need this bit. Oh, maybe we could put on some, maybe put on a tambourine there. Or maybe this could have this. And then, you know, just sort of discussing how to improve the songs and um, or the pieces. And then, you know, eight months later, we had this album. Mm. And, and Mike, um, I've heard Brain Surgeons 3. What, what, what can we expect from the rest of the album? Um, I'd say less accessible than Brain Surgeons 3, maybe, or that's, that's the kind of, our kind of real party tune, I suppose. And uh, some of the other ones are much more uh, esoteric, I suppose, would be a way to describe them, but equally sort of uplifting and generous. Yeah. When you talk about accessible, it's interesting because I, I tend to find with this genre of music, if people who are into it, it's very mm. engrossing and you, mm. you use the word euphoric talking about it. And I think once you get into it, there is that feeling of joy and euphoria associated with it, which, mm. you know, in, in a lot of commercial music, you'd probably listen to it and go, that was all right. Whereas with, with I think, what you're making, you're e you either just don't get it or you're, or you're right into it. Is that a fair assessment? Oh, yeah, to totally, yeah. And it's really nice to make as Mike said, something that sounds so generous and so euphoric without sort of feeling that there's any, I don't know, compromise with what we're doing. It, it, it feels genuine, genuinely kind of yeah, ecstatic while also being, I think, you know, in, in, you know, very musical and very sort of considered, I think. I think that's it. When it's not, when it's not commercial music, you're doing it because you're really, really into it and there's no other agenda. Mm. And I think real music heads can detect that when you know as you say when you hear some commercial music and go well, that's okay yeah. because people making it are thinking about something else there's there's a there's you know, there there there's enough people that don't are not that worried about music funnily enough they 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 have it in their lives but it's there as a sort of in, not in the background but it, it, the pop world feeds that particular part of and then they can get on with the rest of their life after they've listened to it three or four times or whatever many times and it's then it's gone. Mm. But there's people that are a little bit more serious about what they listen to and they're prepared to seek stuff out. And probably how this has come about is we, the three of us are very much in that vein that we would actually prefer to listen to stuff, stuff that needs a bit more legwork to get into but it's got longevity. So therefore, when we've played music together, 
um, which is quite strange for you to say that, but when we play music together, it's gone down that road of something that, that it would be the stuff that we'd listen to, we'd like, but it also, you think, if somebody listens to this three times, they'll like it. First time, they may not like it. They may not get it. But listen to it enough, then it will get into your subconscious. And um, that, for me, is the fascinating thing about it in the first place. So I've always been listening to what you consider to be left-field music, as is Carvis and Mike. You know, and they've obviously played it as well. But to actually be part of it and to then start to be creating is, is quite a fascinating thing. Well, I was going to say, what was really interesting about making music with Steve, because, you know, Mike and I had played together already, but I'd known Steve, you know, known Steve for probably about 12, 13, yeah. 14 years, and we'd, we'd, you know, done a radio show together, and straight away uh, I really got that Steve was a real active listener. And, I mean, a lot of people, like you say, will put on music in the background, but, you know, active listening, you're, you're really engaging with it as if you were reading a book or watching a film you're absolutely you know in there with the music so I always knew Steve was an active listener and when we when we started playing together especially with improvising you really you really have to listen to one another and all all the contributions that, that Steve was bringing into it and then also when we were organizing the album and working out the direction was clearly from the point of view of someone who spent the best part of you know 40 or 50 years absolutely listening inside and behind the notes and, and to the music. No, I'm, no totally, you know. It's, uh, oh, you like it 30? You know, uh, like it 30 years, not 40 or 50. Oh, sorry, years. 50 years, I mean, yeah, it's when right. Did you, when did you start listening to music? Sorry, 50 no. years ago. Yeah. yeah, 50 years ago. <laughs> when did you start listening actively? <laughs> 50 years ago. You bring, you bring more to I don't know when to. Words. I don't know when to retire from my music career. You know, the snooker thing was hard enough to know when to retire. This is different. You know, yeah. this is when you start choice. making bad records, that's always a good, yeah. always a good time. I mean, would, would that more people yeah. would wait for the reviews? <laughs> we're nowhere near. We're nowhere near even the difficult second album yet. I don't know how it's gonna. Uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be dead album. easy. Yeah. <laughs> From my perspective, this has been a journey into the unknown and a magical journey in a totally different to what way to, to, a snooker one. You know, and um, you can't equate the two, but. Yeah, when, when you're lucky enough to have a hobby and then get the, the ability to even try, try it out, as is now the case with yeah, music, you, you can make music in your bedroom that you wasn't available back in the day to some degree. So the, there's the, the ability that everybody can sort of create if they want to. But to bump into these two guys and to actually be sort of effectively chaperoned along the way has been wonderful as well. And it's been, a, it's been a wonderful journey in that respect. And I have to pinch myself, and I'm sure we all do, that we're now in the situation where there's something happening that, as Carver says, does seem a bit magical. Seems like it's, it's sort of fated because there was no plan to have a band. There was no plan prior to that for us two to DJ. There was no plan for me to retire from snooker and move into music. It was just the fact that doors seemed to open. It was accidental to some degree that we bumped into Mike because Mike played in a couple of bands that Carvis has played into. And the whole thing seems to have sort of congealed into this wonderful psychedelic mess that has ended up, <laughs> there's one that has ended up with us making this album that we think is the stuff, we buy it. We've listened to it, we, we've been involved in it. So it's your baby, our baby. But I'd buy it tomorrow if I knew this was coming out. I'd buy it. It's exactly what I want to listen to. And then we, we went to, you know, who, what record label is going to put this out? Well, I don't know. We gave it to Rocket Recordings, record, Rocket Records. And, and they are so much of the like-minded uh, sort of situation. And they went, this is, we, we want to put this out as well. And from their perspective... We want to put this out in spite know, of it, Steve Davis. <laughs> so here's, here's, here's the double-edged sword. There I am, you know... Fairly well known, okay. Then you go and we've made an album. My only previous uh, music, Chas and Dave Snooker Luby. Great track, but <laughs> maybe a novelty track, okay. Really? So then, maybe, maybe, right. And then all of a sudden, Rocket Recordings, Rocket Records get, get given this thing from the three of us. Track record, marvellous. Track record, marvellous. Track record, novelty, okay. <laughs> they go... <laughs> <laughs> The three. Well, although I'm so sure, right. I'm sure some people track records. And well, so they go, okay, we've been given this uh, this demo, um, and they said to us, they said, 
this has got to be bloody good, otherwise we're not touching it with a barge pole, because we're a credible record label. We can't be seen to be getting involved in the novelty. <laughs> so even though I'm a plus, I'm also a massive minus in the whole thing. So we are so proud of our record that a proper record label has trusted that they like it as well, and they're prepared to put it out, because actually it transcends the fact that I'm the liability. And there's the bizarre thing that we've found ourselves in. <laughs> I'm the liability. I'm the there's, liability there's, in this there's band. Your, there's your autobiography title. <laughs> apart, <laughs> apart from the fact that we're going to be going, you know, uh, two pros, right? Well, been on stage, two pros. I'm, we've, we've been doing gigs, and yeah. and we've got to like perform on stage. So, I've, I've popped my cherry at Glastonbury because we do everything uh, ass about face. So not only did we not record live. And then and, and do gigs and then put out an album. We put out an album first and then we played live. They came up with the name for the band yeah. afterwards. And kept, yeah, and, but we our first ever gig was at Glastonbury. Name a band that their first ever gig was at Glastonbury. Meanwhile, the comments section: that hundreds of bands' <laughs> first gig was. The... Oh, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Mike, do you, do you do you think we'll ever find it a bit annoying that you two might be seen as the other two? When, when actually you're the proper musicians. <laughs> no, uh, no, uh, th but I, th the idea that we are the proper musicians and Steve isn't, I think, is is definitely a big error. That um, so I'm keen to avoid that um, <laughs> that interpretation of it, yeah, well, Steve, which is partly uh, propelled by the fact that by, I don't know, <laughs> by no. your modesty. Oh. <laughs> well, well, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Big, but, but there again, this is a fascinating thing is that you look at the instrument that I'm playing. Um, as opposed to some of the instruments that Mike and Carvis are playing, there's, there's a there's something about say the modular synth, which it drew me to because it, there's there's no level of practice needed in one respect. There's no level of dexterity needed, even though as Mike did point out, oh, well, I'm, I'm I'm not short in dexterity, but in a different way. So I haven't had years of training myself on a guitar or or a flute or a, or a set of bagpipes or whatever so this this particular instrument instrument is quite an interesting avenue to go down but you can still produce rubbish from it so it's down to whether it's, it's down to whether you can you've got an ear for it i suppose um it's decision making isn't no, it yeah, really? absolutely no, I, think, it I, think, I can think of yeah. plenty of musicians um no names mentioned that you know are extremely sort of you know good players at their instruments and you know what I hear coming out of it doesn't sound like music. It sounds like a lot of playing, but no music. And I think you, you realise that so much of composition and playing and music it comes from taste and having a good ear for it, not for just having the sort of dexterity or the ability. Because you know there's there's plenty of records out there with brilliant players, and it's like man, it's just finger I don't Olympics. A single decent idea in there. So this is about the moment, Stephen. You you went to a gig and you saw somebody playing the modular synthesizer, and you thought that that could be for me. Yeah, so I went to see um, a band that were on the same record label as us, uh, Teeth of the Sea, and uh, they had a, a sort of offshoot band, um, a guy called Mike Bourne, and he was playing a modular synthesizer. And I thought this looks fantastic. Like there he is, he's all flashing lights and wires all over the place. Wow, that looks good. But he wasn't. He was he was pressing buttons and patching chords in. I thought, what is it? I've never seen anything quite like it. Stupidly, because obviously, if you went back to my childhood, fifty years ago, Sorry right? About that, dude. Yeah. Tangerine Dream, uh, a well-known German band, were sitting on stage with massive banks of synthesizers with patch cords the size of, you know, you know massive leads. Uh, but everything's miniaturized now. But that was being that was going on back then, uh, and in the early days. But I don't think I sort of really even twigged that it was now feasible that this modern day age of sort of miniaturization could mean you could take a briefcase along and, and, and actually sort of have everything at your fingertips if you've got imagination to do it. So the journey I'm on is sort of learning that trade, um, which is fascinating, but it's the fun of it is the, the three of us doing it together because we've, we've got on like a house on fire, hence the name the Utopia Strong. We feel like the music's pretty sort of, you know, out there and otherworldly and we get on so much and so far there's not been a band argument. Yeah. 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 Not yet. Not yet. Not until the difficult second album. We so. talk about you a lot behind your back though. Okay.
<laughs> and uh, have you found, Steve, that your, your sense of kind of artistic merit and, and satisfaction from creating something yourselves is on a kind of different level to what you were doing before with DJ? Yeah, the, the DJing is, is great fun, playing, playing, you're playing other people's music, but you're trying to sort of make sure that everybody has a party. This is another world, and, it, and it's, it's so different to competitive sport. You know, I feel like it's a different part of my brain. And since I've retired, I've sort of slightly changed my outlook. You know, my, the competitive instinct for me is gone completely. I've no interest in that. You know, I mean, to some degree, that's why when I stopped playing, I said I'm not going to play on the senior stuff because I didn't want to compete at any type of level. But because I've had another hobby, which is music, it seems to have opened up that way as well. So I feel, I feel a slightly different animal now. Steve, you've gone, you've gone hippie. I've gone hippie, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I've, I haven't gone to the T-shirt yet, but you know, I'm still but, working but, on the, the plain T-shirt. But you, you, you used to be for you in bed at nine o'clock with a glass of milk. Now you're probably sort of injecting drugs into your eyeballs. At some well, point in the morning, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like... Up at, um, up at nine o'clock. I do feel like it's a very bizarre thing has happened in as much as my life sort of have got... Jimmy White and myself seem to have got, gone in different directions in as much as Jimmy started off, you know, as a party animal and, and also brilliantly doing what he did. And he's now total professional. I'm not saying he wasn't then, but he, you know, he's even admitted it in his book. You know, he's now waking up in the morning, practising and grafting away. He still loves snooker. And I've gone from back when I was in my teens... You know, what, going to bed with a glass of hot milk and, and, and then practising for eight hours a day. And I've gone sort of totally in the opposite direction. And I sort of feel like there's an element of Benjamin Button going on. But if, if you're going to lose the plot, I think it's probably better <laughs> to do it when you're older than when you're younger. But that's beside it. <laughs> no yeah, one so will notice anyway, will they, no, yeah, when you're older? No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the it, it's, it's I mean I don't want to make this all about you know but the the, the snooker world is uh, is fasc it's a fascinating world to be involved in but so is the the, the music world in a totally different way um, and and for the artists are a different beast so I feel quite lucky to have tapped into both you know you, you see the likes of Stephen Hendry's like an animal on the table and, and all of the top players all animals. Um, and every now and again, you'll bump into one who may have a little bit of musical interest, and they're sort of much more down that way. They may get the chance later on to investigate that. But I feel quite lucky to have not jumped ship because it's not been like that. Well, but it's just sort of like to have tasted both aspects. Your brain's wired up like a musician. That's what I thought when I first met you. You know, you'd seemed, um, you know, me and my wife after meeting Steve. You know, God knows how long ago. It's like. He's just like one of our mates, isn't he? He's like, he just, he just seems like a musician. And uh, now, now look, well, nothing's changed. <laughs> but now, now you've got a modulus here. But it, I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough to um, say to, like, to have two hobbies that have become, you know, one massively my profession and the other sort of, you know, occupying my, my time. Badger baiting. Yeah, and uh, on the common. Yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> uh, but then I've been, I've now been, given access to watch how you make a record and watch these two like, lads uh, discussing my new show that I wouldn't have even known about, but now I know a bit more about it, about how to create a track from basically a, like a 20 minute improviser, uh, improvised piece to actually identify which bits are good and how, how you make that go on a flow. There's something I would have never have known and never would have gone anywhere near beforehand. So I feel like I've, a door's open to another universe, which has been quite nice. Uh, Mike, what do you think the, the future for the band is? I have Tough no it. idea, but uh, you know, I hope it carries on the, you know, the way it's going at the moment with you know, more recording, more performance. And, yeah. yeah, it seems to sort of <laughs> increasingly in the last... Well, since we finished the record, um, which was at the end of last year, up until now, just increasingly has become more, you know, taking up more and more of our time. And, yeah, very, very happy about that. You know, this wasn't a group. I think as much as Steve has said, it's a sort of surprise to him. I think it's a surprise to all of us. It wasn't something, uh, you know, any of us was expecting it to get into, you know, from that date, you know, 2nd of January. And then here we are, our record's about to come out and we've got a load of gigs and we're just really, really into it. It's yeah, certainly achieved a lot more momentum than I think we, any of us were expecting, hasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, so I'm hoping that carries on. 
Yeah, yeah. So it, it, we're, we're fortunate in, in one respect that you know we've got off to a flying start, but then the, the product's got to be good. Otherwise, what are we doing? Mm. And 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 the product, for our perspective, if it wasn't any good, we wouldn't have said to a record label, "What do you think of this?" We didn't. It would have never seen the light of day. It's only because it's actually really good to listen to, and I'm not saying. And actually, and if anybody gives it a chance, people that wouldn't think they would like that type of music, if they gave it enough airing, they might like it as well, which which is astonishing because it is quite psychedelic as a, as an album. It's sort of, you know, it's very welcoming. It's very it's very euphoric, but it requires there's an element of repetition which some people don't like. They might like a pop track. They don't want to listen to six minutes of a of, a, of something going round in a cycle. But actually, if you give it space, like any piece of music, if you give it enough listens, you might actually like it.